In the previous video, we started to look at sequences of functions, and we looked at the concept of pointwise convergence. So let's just recall what that is. So if we've got the sequence of functions f sub n, so these are all functions from a to the real numbers, and here n is indexing over the natural numbers, we say that that sequence of functions converges pointwise to a function f, which goes from a to r, if for all x in a, we have the limit as n goes to infinity of f sub n of x equals f of x. And I want to point out here that we're like fixing an arbitrary x, which tells me at this stage right here, we have a sequence of numbers. And so if you think about the epsilon n definition for the convergence of a sequence of numbers, well, perhaps that n is going to depend on epsilon and x, but we'll kind of get to that in a little bit. Okay, also in the previous video, we looked at three important examples. One is kind of a very nice example, and that is these functions f sub n that are defined by x squared over n plus x. And then we showed that those converge to f of x equals x. And the sequence, well, every function in the sequence was differentiable and the limit was differentiable, which kind of gave us hope that this limiting procedure maintained some of the nice behaviors of the sequences of functions. Then we looked at this sequence of functions, which we call g sub n, and that goes from uh, the interval 0, 1 to the real numbers, and g sub n of x is the nth root of x. Then we showed that g sub n converges pointwise to a function g that's defined like this. So it's 0 if x is 0, and then if it's 1 if x is on the half open interval 0 to 1, not including 0. And so notice over here, we've got all differentiable functions. All of these g sub n functions are differentiable, but they converge pointwise to something that's not even continuous. And if it's not continuous, then we can't even start talking about it being differentiable. And so that's a bummer because none of the nice behavior was maintained as we pass to the pointwise limit. Then finally, we looked at this example, h sub n, and that was from this interval minus one, one to r, h sub n x was x to the two n over two n minus one. And here we saw that h sub n converged to h pointwise, where h of x was equal to the absolute value of x. Now, this is a little bit better than the middle example, but not quite as good as the first example, because over here, every function in our sequence was differentiable, but over here, they were continuous but not differentiable. And so this absolute value function is like a canonical example of a function that is continuous but not differentiable. This one's not differentiable at zero. Okay, so we want to tweak this notion of pointwise convergence so it's a little bit stronger so that this behavior is maintained when we pass to a limit. But before we do that, we really need to exchange this statement right here, which is the limit as n goes to infinity of f sub n of x equals f of x with the epsilon n definition of the limit. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, that's better. So here, let's look at our new, like maybe more thorough definition. So we say that this sequence of functions f sub n converges pointwise to a function f if for all x in a and epsilon bigger than zero, there is an n, and notice here I've pointed out that n is possibly going to depend on x and epsilon. So generally it's gonna depend on epsilon, that's pretty much always the case, unless you've got a really kind of boring function. But the important thing here is that it depends on x. It depends on the place where you are within the set, such that if n is bigger than or equal to this capital N, then f sub n evaluated at x minus f evaluated at x, the absolute value of that is less than epsilon. So now what we really wanna do is tweak this 
kind of using the same motivation as the tweak that we made from continuity to uniform continuity. And recall that that tweak had to do where all of the X values were introduced into the definition. And so in that tweak, we had an epsilon and then there existed a delta which was not dependent on epsilon. And so that's kind of what we're gonna do here. So let's go ahead and get that definition on the board. Okay, there we've got it. So we've got this sequence of functions f sub n. Those are functions from a to r. They're indexed over the natural numbers. And we say that that sequence of functions converges uniformly to a function f, which is from a to r, if for every epsilon bigger than zero, there is an n, and here I've pointed out that n may depend on epsilon, but notice x hasn't even been brought, in, brought into existence yet. So there is an n in the natural numbers such that if little n is bigger than or equal to capital N, then f sub n of x minus f of x in absolute values is less than epsilon, and that's true for all x in A. So the important thing here is that notice that this for all x in A happens after this n is brought into existence. So in other words, there's no x dependence in the existence of this capital N, which is driving the closeness of the value of these functions together. Okay, so let's maybe go ahead and get rid of these uh, examples from the last video and we'll look at an example of a uniformly convergent sequence of functions. So for our first example, we're gonna look at the following sequence of functions. So they're defined by f sub n of x equals one over n times one plus x squared. So it's not too hard to see that this sequence of functions probably limits to the zero function. And why is that? Well, one over one plus x squared, well, that's bounded, so it never really gets too big. And then we're dividing that by n. And so, but n is gonna go towards infinity, so that's just gonna kill this thing off. So maybe we have this claim, and that is f sub n converges to f with f of x equal to the zero function. And so let's maybe check to see if that's uniform convergence. So proof, so let's go ahead and say that we are given some epsilon bigger than zero. And then, well, let's go over to the side and do a little side calculation in reverse order that will put in the correct order when we write our proof. So our goal is for f sub n evaluated at x minus f of x to be less than epsilon. But in this setup, that's gonna be one over n times one plus x squared is less than epsilon. Notice if f of x is equal to zero, well then that's just gonna be f sub n of x minus zero, but then this thing is always positive, so I don't need absolute values there. So that's good to know. Now, maybe another thing to notice is the following, so notice that one over one plus x squared, well, the biggest that can be is one. So that's always less than or equal to one. It's equal to one when x is zero. But if x is not zero, well, then you're dividing by something larger than one, so you get something that is smaller. And then notice that's always bigger than zero. But what that tells us is that one over n times one plus x squared is always going to be less than one over n. But then if we can force this one over n to be less than epsilon, then we're good. So this is what we're going to want. But then that means that we need to choose our capital N to be bigger than one over epsilon, you know, by a standard trick that we've seen um, when we were proving sequences before. Okay, so now let's get back to our proof. So given epsilon bigger than zero, let's choose a capital N, this is gonna be a natural number, such that capital N is bigger than one over epsilon. 
and that's possible by the Archimedean principle. So the Archimedean principle says there's always a natural number bigger than any real number that you can give me. So we're just taking n to be that. Now, let's go ahead and notice that, um, now let's launch into the rest of the proof. So let's say maybe note if little n is bigger than or equal to capital N, then that means one over little n is going to be less than or equal to one over capital N, which is less than epsilon. Great. And then maybe we could say since one over one plus x squared is going to be uh, less than or equal to one over one, which is equal to one, that tells us that one over n times one plus x squared is in fact less than or equal to one over n, which is going to be less than epsilon. But now we can just take this guy right here and rewrite it as the difference of f sub n of x and f of x in absolute values, but that's exactly what we needed in order to show this thing converged uniformly. So notice our capital N didn't depend on X. And in fact, we didn't really have to do any calculations with specific values of X at all. So we got uniform convergence here. Maybe let's put up here, this is uniform. We. Okay, good. So let's maybe go ahead and clean this up and then we'll look at an example of something that seems like it's non-uniform convergence. So for our next example, we'll look at the sequence of functions defined by f sub n of x equals x over n. So again, it seems like this should also converge to the zero function. Because if we fix an x, well, we can always send this in larger and larger and larger than that x that's going to make this thing super small. So let's maybe go ahead and prove that claim. So let's claim that f sub n converges to f with f of x equals the zero function. And then we'll add in at the end if this is pointwise convergence or uniform convergence. And we'll actually discuss if we really know um, after the argument that we have or if we need some new tools. Okay, so let's look at the proof. So let's say we are given epsilon bigger than zero. We're gonna do the same thing that we did in the last example, and that is do a side calculation that we can use to rewrite a proper proof. So our goal is to take f sub n of x minus f of x and have that be less than epsilon. But since f of x is the zero function, that kind of simplifies things. Notice that that is equivalent to absolute value of x over n is less than epsilon. Great. But that tells us that we could have n is bigger than the absolute value of x over epsilon. And so this seems to be what we are forced to choose for our capital N. And that's problematic in terms of uniform continuity because it depends on X. So maybe this is only pointwise. Um, and that is problematic in terms of uniform convergence because that depends on X. But maybe it's okay in terms of pointwise convergence. So let's launch into the proof. So given epsilon bigger than zero, let's take N, which is a natural number, such that capital N is bigger than the absolute value of X over epsilon. And again, that's possible by the Archimedean principle. And then we're going to notice that if little n is bigger than or equal to capital N, we have the following. The absolute value of f sub n of x minus f of x is equal to the absolute value of x over little n. But now this is going to be less than or equal to the absolute value of x over capital N by this inequality. But then by our choice of capital N, we see that this is strictly less than epsilon times absolute value of x over absolute value of x, but now that's gonna be equal to epsilon. So now looking at this side of the equation and this side of the inequality, I should say, we see that we have pointwise convergence. So maybe we'll put up here, we could say that this convergence is happening pointwise. Now, 
that really brings us into the question, have we proven that it does not converge uniformly? And we haven't because uh, we've just shown that this method of proof involves taking a capital N that depends on X. In fact, this convergence is not uniform, but we have not proved it here. Okay, in the next video, we'll pick up and we will show that if you've got continuous functions and those are uniformly converging to another function, then that convergent function is itself um, continuous. So in other words, this notion of uniform convergence of functions maintains at least the continuity as you pass to the limit. And that's a good place to stop.